Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Humanities in Action virtual seminar series, Black Lives Matter, the historical quest to respect black bodies and lives. We want to thank you for joining us for this third week. We've had two wonderful engagements in this series, and this morning will be no less. I have with me Dr. Maziki Thame, and she'll be presenting on the theme Poor Black Lives versus Rich Black Lives, Cultural, Historical, and Economic Dimensions, a very important theme. Before we listen to her, we're going to hear a little bit about Dr. Thame. Uh, Dr. Thame is a newly appointed senior lecturer in the Institute of Gender and Development Studies here at the University of the West Indies, Mona Campus. Congratulations, Dr. Thame. Her research focuses on the post-colonial Caribbean, the place of race, class, violence, radicalism, identity, and gender in political life. Her work asks questions about gender, about race and class, and how um, they shape the experiences of citizenship, and how liberation is pursued in the Caribbean modern. Her most recent publications include Woman Out of Place, Portia Simpson Miller, and Middle Class Politics in Jamaica, a, um, and that was in um, the, the journal Black Women and Politics, Demanding Citizenship, Challenging Power, and Seeking Justice. It's a book, um, and you need to look it up. Um, she also has written on racial hierarchy and the elevation of brownness in Creole nationalism, and that was published in Small Acts. So you need to look up those publications, but more importantly, you need to engage this wonderful academic this morning as she speaks along the line of rich versus poor black lives. Over to you, Dr. Thien. And good morning to our um, participants. I want to say th thanks, first of all, to Dr. Nicole Plummer for inviting me to participate in this very important um, series. I think it's important for us to be considering black lives always because there is a question about the value of black lives in these black majority societies of the Caribbean so that we might tend to look to the United States, but the Caribbean is also grappling with problems that have persisted from the slave plantation. And I want to say that my focus is going to be on Jamaica more specifically. Now, while the slave plantation is our starting point, and we could argue also a representation of the past in the present, my focus is on the post-colonial period. I think it's important firstly to interrogate our topic a little bit, and in particular, the idea of rich blacks. Wealth is, of course, a relative category. We can think of it in global, national, and regional terms. But the status of whiteness as opposed to blackness is categorized globally and nationally in differentiated ways in which we find that wealth is concentrated in white hands globally. and they live in the global north or the developed world where ra other racial groups also reside and are able to partake in the wealth of the global north. But at the same time, poverty is concentrated in the global south or the developing world, and we we'll find that those areas of the globe are non-black. Where other racial groups are represented in the distribution of wealth in the global north, we find that it is not equal. So Pew Research estimates that in the United States, 
white households are worth 20 times as much as black households, and whereas only 15% of whites have zero or negative wealth, over a third of blacks do. Non-white countries, as I said, make up the global north, and though we have the rise of Indian millionaires in the world, the greatest poverty, as I said, rests in those locations. The historical root of the maldistribution of wealth in the world is colonialism and capitalism, and it burdens blacks the most. And we can turn here to the work of Eric Williams in Capitalism and Slavery, where he showed how the construction of capitalism de depended principally on the exploitation of black labor through the transatlantic slave trade, which built Europe's wealth. And, and this is part of the um, factor that matters in the ongoing conversation around reparations. Now, racist capitalism, most flagrantly anti-black racism, um, has built white wealth fortified white status over other human beings, and anti-blackness as a feature of racist capitalism is a legacy of European enslavement of Africans, Africans in the Americans. European construction of racist knowledge systems to justify it, and further, the maintenance of global white supremacy within historical forms of capitalism, within colonialism, Jim Crow in the United States, and apartheid in South Africa, and more recently in neoliberal capitalism that keeps those already at the bottom cemented there. Now, throughout the Caribbean, it is difficult to think of a collective rich black. Its ownership structure does not suggest this category to be significant. That in Barbados, for example, um, there is a debate and attempts to democratize the economy away from the structure in which whites control the resources of a nation. And in Jamaica, Stanley Reed's 1977 study, an introductory approach to the concentration of power in the Jamaican corporate economy and notes on its origin, showed that the Jamaican economy was controlled by ethnic minorities, in particular 21 families through control of the corporate economy. Now that study requires updating, which would include questions of whether new concerns about how the ownership of resources is being diversified in the interests of the Chinese, is well whether or not that is well-founded, and whether local and transnational white and non-black capital and, eth and ethnic minority control of Caribbean economies has been displaced. It is also important to note that status and power as far as any lives matter, are not simply defined by wealth. In that vein, racial status and power was conferred on the socially constructed racial category of brownness on the plantation and continued into the present in the absence of wealth. And I want to turn here to how it is that the social construction of brownness also mattered in terms of the socioeconomic distribution of wealth in Jamaica. Through surveys conducted in 1984, Derek Gordon showed that despite the tremendous changes in the location of black Jamaicans in the class structure, particularly in the wage earning classes, stubborn racial differentials in position and opportunity remained. His research showed that in spite of, quote, class background, light-skinned persons are more likely to get into the middle class or to remain there once they started out there than their black counterparts. While anyone with high professional and managerial backgrounds were likely to remain in the middle class, light-skinned persons were more likely to do so than blacks. If we compared those with working class backgrounds, the differences are still quite striking. 37% of light-skinned persons with a working class background were able to end up in the middle class occupations compared to 21% of black people with similar black backgrounds. And he's using the social construction of race here in Jamaica to differentiate between black and brown because they cannot be easily collapsed in the Jamaican context. Gordon concluded that this pattern suggests that quote, racial dif differentials cannot be reduced to prior class differentials. So there's often this debate in Jamaica about whether we're talking about race or class and we often settle on the idea that it is class that we are talking about. But one of the things that I want to explore, hopefully, 
is this the way in which the intersection of race and class is carrying over anti-blackness into our understandings of our um, interactions with each other and into the racial power structure. So Gordon's work is also in need of updating, but it is consistent with the reality that there is in Jamaica an overrepresentation of blacks at the bottom. The face of poverty in Jamaica being both black and dark-skinned Indians who are descendants of indentured workers who came in the post-emancipation period. There is no significant representation of other ethnic minorities in the lower socioeconomic class grouping. Now, after independence, blacks' advancement into the middle classes was facilitated through political ferment of the 1960s and 1970s, in particular the emergence of black power and the questioning of the racial power structure and the rise of the left, the political left in the 1970s that was seeking to democratize conditions um, and to impact blacks especially favorably in that period. Indeed, efforts to democratize the economy and social life from below were intense in that period. And according to Carl Stone, the expansion of education for the majority and the departure of ethnic minorities in the 1970s that emerged out of the conflicts between class and racial groups in Jamaica allowed for blacks entry into entrepreneurial, the entrepreneurial class and into upper levels of private sector management. At the same time, Rupert Lewis indicates that while Jamaica's black entrepreneurial class has been steadily increasing, it has not yet displaced the control of ethnic minorities over the, over the corporate sector. While this remains a problem at the top, at the bottom, grave socioeconomic conditions for blacks begs the question, what is the value of black life? Lewis would thus caution that, quote, the need to address socioeconomic deprivation, a key demand of the black power movement, remains an ongoing issue, unquote. In addition, the maintenance of anti-black ideas across social sectors in Jamaica has its more, most severe impact on those at the bottom. Now, we are thinking about um, wealth in economic terms here, but I want to suggest that economic power should not be distinguished from political power, and that they are in fact mutually repro reproducing and the intersections of politics and, inter and economics give us a lens through which to understand the cultural norms and, by extension, the value of black life within it. The decolonization process in Jamaica was preoccupied with race. It held strands of anti-blackness, and I would argue it cemented brown power. The decolonization period is to be distinguished from the post-slavery movement, movement for change such as occurred within the alliance of the brown George William Gordon, who was a representative in the House of Assembly, with the black religious and peasant leader, Paul Bogle, in the Morant Bay War of 1865. That alliance represented a real threat to white power and the possibility of a black and brown agenda for racial transformation, but that was not to define the Jamaican situation in independence. It may be of symbolic importance that Bogle was battling from the bottom and Gordon from the position of representative politics, since politics after the 1938 labor rebellions, which served as a basis of politics in independent Jamaica, came to be led by Browns. Carl Stone argued that Jamaica developed a leadership tradition that was biased in favor of selecting persons of light skin color. The important point is that this was a choice of the Jamaican people, and I would argue is a part of the anti-blackness that Jamaicans hold. And we see here the images of the um, independence leaders. I have included Norman Manley, though he was never prime minister. Um, he was premier and, quote unquote, father of Creole nationalism. It's a little bit out of order in that um, Edward Siaga's image um, should actually follow um, not Michael Manley's, but um, these are the shortcomings of my expertise. Now, the, we see here that the majority of leaders, the, the majority of persons who come to power in independent Jamaica are Browns. And the three prime ministers who came to power since independence 
the unelected Hugh Shearer, um, P.J. Patterson, and Portia Simpson Miller have all faced problems of legitimacy. Now, while the first elected black prime minister, P.J. Patterson, was, Hugh Shearer was not elected. Um, Patterson um, was, as a result, the first elected um, black prime minister. Though he served for four terms in office, he complained that he never received the respect he deserved as prime minister, despite all he had done for the country. And he names the accomplishments in the PNP 65th conference in which he declares, quote, I know that I have never got the respect where respect is due for the things that I have done. He argued that he had expanded access to education from basic to tertiary levels, expanded the middle class, built highways, expanded access to running water and electricity, and reduced poverty. Journalist Ken Chaplin argued that Patterson was alluding to the possibility that this was due to racial factors. Under the leadership of P.J. Patterson, a brand of black nationalism which sought to expand the wealth of the black middle class, particularly in the construction and financial sectors, had success, or some amount of success, in achieving his goal. But Patterson's attempts were eventually stymied with the collapse of the quote-unquote indigenous financial sector. And if you recall, um, Patterson's mantra in the electoral period was quote-unquote black man time now. And they suggested that they had been out of power up to this point. Simpson Miller was a more complex representation of the contours of racial power than, than Patterson, I would argue. Because whereas Patterson had, Patterson's problems of legitimacy did not include his ascension to the po position of quote-unquote respectable black, Simpson Miller was routinely diminished to the status of the vulgar dogged by stereotypes of black women at the bottom. These realities, I would argue, emerged on a cultural plane that valued brownness as an ideal and that held attachments to Eurocentrism at, while at the same time devaluing Africa in Jamaican's self-construction. And I want to turn here to the, to the independence period and the way in which brown nationalism took hold in the identity politics of the, the nation around this idea that brownness was who we were. And if you see here on um, our slide, there is an image here of what they aspired for in independent Jamaica. We are the citizens of independent Jamaica, out of many one people, to, who are you know, to live in harmony, work for progress, and keep our standards high. Now, if you look at the images, even the dark-skinned figure does not look African, right? And there is a sense of, you know, what we aspire for in this image. Cultural power can be assessed through what I would call the battle between black nationalism that has attempted to capture the minds of people of African descent throughout the black world in the 20th century, especially with its roots in the 19th century, and the success of brown nationalism in places like Jamaica. Brown nationalism can be seen as a political project of defining Jamaica, not only as a place of cultural hybridity, but also as a place of and for the hybrid body, the brown quote-unquote race. Its ethos was developed before independence and shown in the aspirations of the Manleys and within the Drum Blair movement, Drum Blair being the home of Edna and Norman Manley, where the leadership of the period met. Its cultural tendency celebrated Britishness, and it sought the construction of respectability within the population. Robert Boudin describes John Blair as relying on the British myth of a genteel, polite, and mannerly society, paternalistic welfare morality, and universalized Europhile culture constructed as a device to mask the harsh reality of poverty of the empire and any guilt about it. The elevation of brownness in the Jamaican hierarchy began on the plantation, but was enhanced in Jamaican politics through the vision of the elder Manleys. Phenotypically white, according to Brian Meeks, and with a mother who had hidden any connection to blackness, Edna had in her self-perception acknowledged her black ancestry. And we see this in her letter to Norman Manley when she is um, contesting her, her mother contested the marriage between Norman and Edna, and she's writing to him, you know, affirming her love and what she sees their marriage as. And this is what she says: 
The colored, that is mixed race, can never die out. The colored race has to go on now. White people are going to be forced to accept them when they see them developing superior intellects with fine physiques. It is a race that is beginning. It has enormous possibilities and with a great tendency towards producing that indefinable person, the genius. I want to do my share towards improving and helping on a new race. We are both intelligent and I have great hopes of what our child will be. I don't want him to be white. I want him to have your own beautiful brown skin and I want him to grow up proud of his race. And there's a way that this kind of thinking around, uh, around brownness is not only captured in the manly's self-conceptions, but also in the way that they imagine the nation. Her vision of brownness as the beginning of a new race that can never die out and that has the potential for greatness symbolizes what Edna and Norman Manley would seek to create for the new Jamaican. It was, I would argue, contending with blackness and seeking to demobilize blackness but not race. It gives in place of blackness, brownness. Manley was clear that non-racialism and harmonious multiracialism, which is captured in the national motto, did not exist and had to be constructed and that could be constructed through brownness. He argued that Jamaica's history had left it with, quote, two main streams, one coming from Europe and the other from Africa, and the process of mixing among these cultures and shaking them together to form some sort of unified whole was far from complete. The assertion of hybridity maintained a negative view of Africa and blackness and their place at the bottom of the hierarchy of civilized and savage, however. Rex Nettleford posits that Manley was keenly aware of the need to uplift the African element. He claims Manley understood that the problem of race and color turned on the need for the African element in the Euro-African complex to gain more than a measure of social and economic equality to get lasting fusion. And hence, Manley says, quote, the immediate past has attempted to destroy the influence and the glory of Africa, attempted to make us condemn and mistrust the vitality, vigor, the rhythmic emotionalism that we get from our African ancestors. Now, the way that Manley frames the African element does not suggest the equality that Nettleford claims was at stake. The legacy of Africa is to be understood within the realm of the emotional and the physical vitality, vigor, and rhythm, which was not outside of normative understandings that elevated the quote-unquote thinking European and stereotyped the instinctive African. On the other hand, Manley's view of brownness was that it could shift our focus away from the gaze on Europe. He said, quote, we are not English and we should never want to be. He argued, we have in Jamaica our own type of beautiful beauty, a wonderful mixture of African and European. Now, this so-called mixture was, has been especially important in the assessment of the value of women of African descent and has contributed to the popularization of the practice of skin bleaching in Jamaica. Bleaching is, as such, a self-affirming practice that means to come up against anti-blackness, but it fails because it is at the same time a representation of anti-blackness. The identity politics of the brown nationalist vision elevated brownness to the point, the point of reference for identity, racial discourse, status, and power. It also, by extension, maintained categories that would be used in assessments of the cultural product and norms emerging from the people. So the debasing of the Jamaican language, for instance notions of beauty that um, attach closeness to Africa as signals of ugliness, backwardness, or failure to progress. Um, relatedly, body politics expressed in hairstyles, the um, preference for straight or wavy or long hair, whereas afros and locks do not get a pass. Notions of slackness versus culture in the debate around the legitimacy of dance hall. The early attempt to delig delegitimize reggae the elevation of rural and sometimes dead practices as respectable national cultural forms versus popular forms within institutions like the Jamaica Cultural Development Corporation, and also in the respectable black versus those at the bottom. And I, I want to just 
um, speak to how we learn about these things, you know, when we are children in Jamaica. And I, I wanted to provide some excerpts from textbooks that children read in Jamaica. In particular, this one is called Fun with Reading, an Integrated Infant Reader. Now, this is a theme around our people from Africa. And if you look at the images, you'll see that these are not Africans there. But the poem is telling you something, if you are to think about it, you know, in terms of black bodies. Come and come. Come with your little doll. Come, Pam, come. Come with your big doll. Come, let us play. Come out of the sun, Anne. Come out of the sun, Pam. The sun is not good for you. Let us go under the big tree and play. You know, what is it saying to children of African descent? I mean, you know, in a black majority country. And then to turn to the representations of other groups of peoples, this is looking at the Jewish history in Jamaica. And it says, it is Jamaica Day at school. Mr. Aaron comes to Jamaica, Jamaica Day. Mr. Aaron is a Jew. He comes to Jamaica Day to tell us his story. Here is a story Mr. Aaron tells. I come to Jamaica... I came to Jamaica a long time ago. I came to Jamaica from Portugal. Portugal is a country in Europe. In Portugal, I was not free to worship. I left Portugal with my family and came to Jamaica. In Jamaica, I'm free to worship. In Jamaica, I'm free to work and take care of my family. I have a store. In my store, I sell rings, watches, and necklaces. I have many Jamaican workers in my store. So who are these Jamaican workers? You know, is Mr. Um, Aaron not... A Jamaican himself and there's a what I would call an unconscious you know construction of the Jew as somehow different and the black or it doesn't actually say black but who, you know this Jamaican worker is a black and we know that in terms of hiring um, the employer um, with the means is oftentimes an ethnic minority person right <coughs> I want to turn also to um, uh, the distinction between uptown and downtown that emerges in the Jamaican consciousness and how it is that this, there is an intersection with racial concerns here. And this slide is showing a, an image that was part of a production that was advertising parties of summer in around 2016. It was eventually withdrawn because there was some uproar about its content. But to give you a sense of the way in which the differences are imagined, the regular versus the all-inclusive party. At the regular party, which is arguable ac according to this um, publication, arguably the original type of party, no holes barred, no clothes barred, and typically attended by Amistad and friends. Usually encompasses an all-night fashion show that ends up as a laundromat cleaning, Sadiqi and the G-Unit dancers included. At the time, Sadiqi and G-Unit dancers were popular. Pros and cons. No one takes care what they wear, which is evident when blackers take off something starts to play. So there is a sense in which you know, the participants are just you know, not caring about what they have presumably because they have nothing. And then, of course, since they're Amistad and friends just off the slave ship, um, there is a sense in which they are at the bottom. And um, just to any domestic differences will be, se will be settled on the spot. There is a construction of who these people are. And that is to be differentiated from the all-inclusive um, party, which is usually a themed party, food, liquor, supposedly hot people inclusive, with a side order of who's who's and Paris Hilton's. Usually encompasses an all-night fashion show and small plates, Lorraine, Lorraine Fong included. So this is indicating it's a high-class event. And then when it comes to pros and cons, it says, if your family is predominantly black, you could get lucky and find a mate at the party and your kids would end up mixed or light-skinned. So it's indicating to you the spaces in which you have opportunities, potential to improve yourself if you are a black. And it goes on to you know, qualify the party space, but I want to move on. So anti-blackness finds its severest expressions against those who carry the burden of blackness and poverty at the same time. 
Blacks as a whole have not been guaranteed equal access to material benefits, protections under the law, political influence, cultural respect or freedom from violence, and most powerfully, recognition of being human. The place of blacks was shaped by ideas about whose labor can be used in what ways, who should be privileged, who should become propertied, protected, and subsidized by the state, and they mirrored slave plantation models into the 20th century. In the post-colonial period, race remained an important qualifier in determining one's access to the spoils of the nation, one's possibilities of receiving fair treatment. It qualified public space and the quality of public goods, who could access beaches or who could get parks, roads, clean markets, and public bathrooms. But poor blacks have least access of all. And I think COVID-19 showed this especially clearly. And I want to turn here um, to a, a, a news report that captured this distinction between how you could live if you were a poor black or a quote unquote rich black, or at least in the middle class. The reality that persons aren't taking the matter of physical distancing seriously is reflected in the downtown Kingston Market District almost daily. A check of what happens on Saturdays, one of the busiest market days in downtown, again proves the point. Kirk Wright has that story. Corona, Corona, she better than Ebola. Hey! Jamaicans clearly still not seeing the grim picture of the deaths overseas caused by COVID-19 the new invisible enemy. This is downtown Kingston and Saturday. It's a perfect place for great bargains, but also the ideal environment for the COVID-19 virus to be passed on. Now, here at West Parade, this is the center of the market district here in downtown Kingston. And I can tell you, there's hardly anything down here that resembles social distancing. We spoke to some of the people down here, and most of them tell us that they have to be here because they have to hustle. Along Beckford Street, the usual stream of vendors and shoppers bouncing into one another. A vendor who refused to give his name says shoppers downtown don't concern themselves with physical distancing. When people want them things and people want what they want and what they need, they're not turning on them house, they're not keeping distance. That's what I think said. Right now, them talk about Corona. Look at that talk. I look out down still. People still have to do them things because people have to do them things. It's who have money keep them this time. But we have poor people can we can be this time. We have to mix and mingle in the crowd that look our own. We rich? Absolutely not. Who rich keep them this time? Look at the crowd. Ask them where they come from. I be a ghetto people there. If you want to ask everybody where they come from, I'll be in the ghetto. We have to do that because we have to look our own. This time, you have to keep your distance now. Another vendor totally disregarded the idea. No, no, I can't answer questions, I will not answer. Are you staying far from each other? Are you staying far from each other? When I stay far from each other, I other far. What kind of new world the coronavirus? Then that's still lost, eh? That's still lost, still. What do you mean? Uh, I mean, I... Where do you sell the kitchen? Who? Somebody, where do you sell the kitchen? 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 With that, we asked why some people have thrown caution to the wind. No, they're not taking it serious to them. I don't know why, because it seems that them don't see them, um, them parents die, you know, like them family, but they're on them, die, you know, but them only hear people die. For the most part, the establishments downtown complied and only allowed a limited number of persons inside. Maximize five customers in other shop. Every time when they are coming, we have to spray them hand with alcohol or hand sanitizer. And then after one come out, one next customer is coming. We have to try to keep it up and make sure every customer is safe and my work is be safe. But the people who form queues outside, waiting to access businesses, act oblivious to the need to keep safe distances. You have to keep reminding yourself. Everybody miss up. Some people are expecting the government will soon announce a total lockdown of the country. There are varying positions on that. Well, I would be so worried because um, people have to live. It, is, it would be a good idea, um, you know, to stop the spread of the thing. But on the, on the other end, you now people, like some people, do, they only do like anti-mouth thing, you know, like that's what they live off of, like buy and sell and stuff. So it's hard. 
He locked down himself. He late now can lock it in if she unlocked that out a long time. The St. William Grand Park downtown, where vendors would usually go to use the toilet facilities, have been closed since the first COVID-19 case was discovered in Jamaica. A donut vendor says, now, there is nowhere for food vendors to wash their hands. You have to go into a Burger King and Mothers and buy a ticket for you the bar, and sometimes at the bottom not working. Kirk Wright, TVJ News. So there's not even a place to wash your hands, right? And people understand that they are here to die in a sense. And in order to live, they have to make these, you know, difficult decisions about their realities. Now, if we take any street in downtown Kingston in normal times that is occupied by informal vendors in, um, as emblematic and symptomatic of the status of blackness and the black poor in Jamaica, we would encounter a community left to itself in terms of access to the resources of the state, but nonetheless in a full bid for survival as black strugglers and sufferers in the 21st century dispensation of black dislocation in global capitalism. Black men and women are selling beauty and beautification on sidewalks, even while such, such activities are traditionally private ones. Black men and women are selling cheap clothes to other blacks on the basis that it complements their complexions, bleached or not. A statement of the acceptance of brownness as valued, as well as the route to escape blackness. Black men and women are also selling food grown out of the labor of people of African descent in rural Jamaica. They are doing so in places filled with garbage, dirty water, and stench in the air. The environs signal questions about the worth of the people who find themselves there. It evidences Jamaica's racial economic disparity with its Chinese wholesalers competing with and profiting from bleached and other poor blacks whose commerce is on the streets and sidewalks where there is competition between vehicular, ve vehicular and human traffic filth, and in a word, a sort of chaos. Throughout downtown Kingston, there is evidence of wealth and poverty, them and us. Transnational non-black and local non-black capital and black slums and hustling. Its disparities speak to the lack of provisions made for the black poor who are determined to survive by their hustle and their bid to make something out of nothing. Anti-blackness is also seen in heavy-handing policing in Jamaica and throughout the Caribbean. Violence and the stigmatization and criminalization of the poor, the squatter, the street hustler as part of the everyday reality of blackness on, on the basis that Jamaicans are especially ungovernable and need to be controlled by authoritarian measures. It is seen in the way politics and violence have curtailed people's movements, particularly through the construction of the garrison and garrison politics. And I wish to reference that historical process as violent in its genesis and maintenance. And here, there's a quotation here that is cited, cited in um, Clinton Hutton's 2010 publication, O Rudy, in which it is capturing the beginnings of the construction of Tivoli Gardens and um, you know, this, the environs of West Kingston. Now, between 1963 and 66, then Minister of Development of Jamaica and Representative of Jamaica Labour Party, Edward Siaga, had committed to building housing for squatters in Baca Wall, a place he deemed a quote-unquote den of criminality. Siaga was concerned to build housing for JLP supporters whom he said needed to live together. West Kingston had since adult suffrage in 1944, swung to both sides in elections, and Edward Siaga won in 61 by a small margin. In the process of clearing the area for construction of housing, this is what occurred, and this is coming out of the Gleaner reports. Over 1,500 shacks on Foreshore Road and Industrial Terrace were bulldozed and razed during the operation. Some squatters moved hundreds of other shacks to Riverton City, Moonlight City, Sligoville, Tower Hill, and Spanish Town, while others have either rented rooms or moved to the Maypen Cemetery. And some of them slept in the open at Industrial Terrace, while others slept on the sidewalks of Foreshore Road. An estimated 100 children are remaining, shel remaining shelterless with their parents either on the bulldoze set settlements, Maypen Cemetery, or Industrial Terrace and Foreshore Road sidewalks. 
That was after the police were trying to get squatter children sleeping with their parents on the sidewalks of Industrial Terrace and Foreshore Road and Maypen Cemetery into corporate area homes of safety. The overwhelming majority of mothers refused to part with their children, the police said. The violence of it, you know. Now, the idea of garrisons and ghettos as, as dens of criminality has persisted in policing practices against poor blacks in Jamaica. And this view, I would argue, has justified the use of extraordinary violence against them. In addition, I would argue that the high levels of horizontal violence in Jamaica is both a product of the racial hierarchy and opportunity structure, which overwhelmingly locates blacks in the category of the sufferer and carry internalized anti-blackness that says that black life is without value. This is captured in the treatment of men this was captured in the treatment of members of the community of West Kingston in the 2010 incursion, which was deemed the most intense assault on the area. The official count of dead was 70 in the joint police and military operation, but community members estimate that over 200 people were killed. Though it was the most grave up to that time, it was not the first of such assaults. Indeed, Deborah Thomas points out that when it occurred, community members saw it as normal. They could recount several such experiences in their recent past. She states, quote, residents of Tivoli Gardens experienced the recurrence of state incursions into their community as part of the general fabric of existence signaled by their use of the words norm and normally in their narratives. Thomas points to the value of black life in the narrative of Sean Bowen, a victim of the Tivoli incursion, she says, quote, Sean Bowen tells us about policemen taunting them and saying that since Passa Passa, a popular street dance formerly held on Wednesday on the main road bordering Tivoli Gardens would not be held that evening, the men would have to enact it for the police right there and then. Sean continued, so right now we had to fall in with some clapping because it's like a stage show we have to provide for these guys now. The humiliation that we're under right now, we had to perform a stage show for them, clapping, singing, falling in, who are DJ, a DJ, and them thing there. Statements like this, Thomas said, su says, suggest that time moves but nothing changes. The men tied to each other and moved from place to place under the threat of, gun, of the gun in 2010 were not effectively different from the slaves brought on deck during the Middle Passage to play music, dance, and be exercised, or those on plantations who were ordered to entertain whites. These are the same forms of humiliation, the same connotations regarding the value of their personhood." End quote. These experiences are not extraordinary, but are part of the everyday reality of blackness and speak to the value of blackness in our society. To arrive at the value of black lives, regardless of their place in the socioeconomic structure, we must contend with the past and the ways in which the post-slavery, post-colonial state has been constructed to keep blacks in their place at the bottom. We must think through the black body and ask, what does it mean to wear a black body in the 21st century Caribbean, and what is needed to ensure its dignity? What does it mean when the black body becomes brown, and what measures can be taken to destroy the hierarchy of color? What does it mean to live as a black, having to navigate the meaning labor conditions, live in the ghetto, be curtailed in one's movement, by be prevented from free access to the land and the sea? These are also epistemic questions about the meaning of blackness. We can draw on the historical attempts to redeem blackness, such as in Rastafari, black power, or Garveyism, or in the contemporary visions, which while not attached to a political program for wholesale social transformation per se, are seeking space in which the black can be affirmed, in which blacks are seen to belong in places of leisure, in which their survival is guaranteed, free of the punishing violence of the state that deemed them blacks and unworthy of dignity. And I want to end there. Wow. We really want to thank you, um, Dr. Thame, for, for that powerful presentation. Um, you really have brought into focus this question of poor black lives versus rich black lives, cultural, historical, and economic dimensions. Um, you've said some things that have needed to be said for a long time all at once. And they are being said in the lecture rooms of this university. But the, the way in which this now would go out into the wider society, as this engagement seeks to do, is, is profound and powerful. Um, you, in your questions at the end, 
um, you talk about some of the imperatives that need to be dealt with if we are to move forward. I want to ask you, what are the areas of hope that may exist um, that would allow us something to build on in the direction of greater regard, um, even though there is that historical albatross, the greater regard um, for the black body, and, 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 and what are the things that, that stand in the way from, from and, and you spoke about the things that stand in the way in one sense, but what are the things that jeopardize that project still? of all that we are surviving right now I mean that is in a way taken for granted but if you consider our history there is a context in which it says that we were not meant to survive yes. but people are moving regardless yes. and they're I, I don't want to so the other side of the um, you know suffering is the resilience yes and I don't want to say that suffering should be any kind of norm but I think our survival is important yes and then there is always a counter narrative to you know the mainstream and sometimes that counter narrative captures the mainstream so the Gavi was Jamaica's first national hero even though there was a political um, decision to do that in, in a sense of catering to the black population by Edward Siaga at the time. But the fact is that the state has to contend with these bodies. And sometimes when we push, it does. So right now, there is a debate around the wearing of locks in school emerging out of the Supreme Court judgment around yes. the child at Kensington Primary. Yes. And there are people pushing back against whether or not the legal judgment is correct. They're pushing back against this idea that anti-blackness should inform the standards for our children. Yes. So I guess I would want to, to, to suggest that there is a need for an expansion of that counter-narrative, that affirming narrative of blackness that comes up against the bleaching, that you know, comes up against the constant devaluation. Yes. But the, the expansion is not immediately ready. So it's um, difficult to say that we are in a moment of revolution. I think it's important that Black Lives Matter is um, expanding its reach in the United States. Yes. And that is saying something to us about how we need to think about our own realities. And whether in these black majority societies, a critique has to be leveled and we have to make demands for change. And it's very important that we raise that critique because for, for the fact that we are now self-governing to a great extent compared to the, the situation before independence, many people would, would not see the effect of the, the hundreds of years of, um, of, right. of, of exclusion of the black man right. it's and a black long, woman long history. Um, that it is now at a point of self-infliction. And I, I'm really happy about how you brought that out. There are several comments that are, uh, have been posted to YouTube. I want to thank our YouTube audience for tuning in. And I want to um, just share some of these comments and questions. Um, wow at Gordon's work in 1984. To what extent has this really changed in 2020 Jamaica? Now I know you have spoken to some extent about that. UWE Museum also says didn't know about Gordon's work. It definitely needs to be up updated. Any comments on, on that work? Well, just that it needs to be updated. So um, the, if we, I don't have the stats to say what are the, the possibilities for social mobility in Jamaica for those at the bottom. But we do know that education is, is a route. Yes. And one of the things that um, is a problem in the education system is discrimination on language grounds that I would argue prevents many of our children from you know, advancing in the education system. So that for me, in addition to getting the statistical evidence to say that it is the case that blacks' possibilities for social mobility are reduced when compared to other racial groups, mm. I think there are also you know, obvious steps that are before us. We have the data that is suggesting that our children are being left behind in the English language and that we have the U.S. work that is telling us that if we teach them English as a second language from their Jamaican language, 
then we can improve literacy and numeracy. Mm. So that, yes, the research is needed, but I think we also have evidence before us that can be used Act to transform the realities. Yes, yes, the response. And, and I want to highlight the fact that a lot of the issues that are being raised now are things that have been studied um, with great depth um, by scholars here at the university and by students here at right. the University of the West Indies. And that is why, one of the reasons why the humanities matters, you know, this, this whole agreed, series agreed. is also <laughs> about, about that. So a yeah. lot of the, the, the fixes um, remain. You talk about education, and I'm looking at the fact that there's an educational transformational um, commission mm -hmm. that has now been called, interestingly, and I'm, I'm very encouraged to know that it is Professor Orlando Patterson who will be heading this. Um, no doubt some of these issues will emerge right. um, from that process. Um, Dr. Nicole Plummer, um, the organizer of, right. of this series, says, I love how this states that we all unconsciously and consciously know um, read the parties and the social scene. So, so there are ways in which mm -hmm. this is st still being lived out. And I was, uh, uh, I was taken aback at the narrative yeah. from that social event. Um, but this is young people who who are engaging these events. Um, is it is it that young people have adapted to this notion that it could even be thought that that could be a pull? for them for a social event in, in, in this period of time now? 2016, I think you said? Well, aspirationalism is a part of our world, right? Um, there is a way that capitalism captures our imagination. We want more. We mm. want material goods. And that is attached to class, mm -hmm. right? So that the moving up is attractive to people in yes. general. Yes. And that manifests itself in specific cultural um, ways mm -hmm. in Jamaica. Now, there is, I would argue, even since 2016, there is a greater integration of social space. And we move through time. I mean, I mean there, are, there are ups and downs on this. So, for example, in 1970s, there would have been more social integration that occurs th than occurs in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. But... Um, there may be an extent to which dance hall has is now it has a legitimate place, and so there is movement from uptown downtown. Mm -hmm. um, what remains to be seen is whether the hierarchy of uptown downtown um, still persists or can be displaced rather, and whether there is as free a movement from downtown uptown. Um, it may be the case mm -hmm. that there is more inclusion once you have the, the money yes. to participate in these events, and money is not necessarily gotten only through social class. And that kind of integration would, would challenge our ideas about you know, what we want for ourselves. Yes. Carrie Banton picks up on that point when she says, fascinating, especially the bit about the exclusive parties as a place of anti-blackness. They get ever more exclusive every time black people discover a way to get in. <laughs> and they're not going to be left out. <laughs> That's a part of um, <laughs> That is a push. part of the re resilience Blacks and determination. They're the not going to be left out, right. Um, that, that idea of, of um, not being left out, um, the, 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 the way in which the narrative of the brown here is 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 a, a narrative that is also coming from the black gaze in one sense the, the the way in which black eyes look upon the bodies of those who may not be experiencing blackness mm -hmm. in the way that they are but the gaze from the perspective of those who have traditionally been othering persons would see them the brown as black as well yeah, yeah. Um, and, and and that's uh, yeah could you come so race is of course socially constructed right, right? is a, a floating it's signifier as right so says. depending on where we are yes. how our societies construct race that is how we you know that shapes the the power dynamics within race yes. so the brown in Jamaica is a black in the United States right now brownness matters throughout most of the African diaspora mm -hmm. in Latin America in the Caribbean 
and it is in the United States where the one drop rule. This is not to say that brownness doesn't matter in the United States, but the white presence and white power diminishes its value. So it is unable to move up in the way that it has in the Jamaican context or wider, you know, Latin American context. Um, but there is, I want to say, always a kind of, you know, battle for space. And so I don't even want to suggest that, um, while at the same time there is anti-blackness, yes. there is a way that the majority black context in the Caribbean gives us a certain confidence around blackness and a sense that the nation belongs to us. Even in reality, we can't access the beach, mm, right? Don't but there know. is a way that there is a confidence around blackness that comes out of the black majority context that we can travel with as an armor, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But then we navigate race differently depending on where we are. Mm. So Forces world over, but particularly from places that have experienced colonialism, mm -hmm. um, including the United States, um, would have had an engagement that makes the police representative of that arm of, of hegemonic domination. Mm -hmm. um, and I've always been fascinated by the fact that our police force has its birth date at the time of the Morant Bay Rebellion. Mm -hmm. So it is created literally to keep blacks away from threatening the 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 um the the, the status quo. Right. Um, could you could you comment on that? The police force and, and this is globally. The police force doesn't protect everyone equally, right? Um, and in our Jamaican context there is a there is an idea of who the threat is. So states of emergencies, the occupation of communities is not something that people quote unquote uptown experience, right? They don't experience the um, the curtailment of their movement in the way that the police force have acted as occupied um, entities in communities that are poor. And that has to do with the idea that this is where criminality resides, yes. right? But there is also a way that we construct criminality. So for example, before um, the use of ganja was decriminalized, mm -hmm. um, Mario Dean came into police custody right. because he was sitting on a corner in his community. And because the police presence is um, heavy in communities that are poor, something that middle-class people would be doing normally in their homes, he becomes criminalized for, and he goes into the system and is killed, right? And it is the way in which policing occurs and the law occurs in a way that you know, discriminates particular sets of people and that we can employ the forces to keep the threat out mm. and protect those who um, you know, we believe are worthy of our, our protections of the state. And it's um it's it's not just a Jamaican thing, you know. Um, the the um, the rate of the police force to the to to the population in a place like Barbados is uh, is high, mm. even though it's not thought of as you know a place of high criminal um, behavior activity. Yeah. Right, right. Wow, uh, Doctor Tim. There, there are so many comments that are coming in. Um, I'll just read a few more, and then we will um, we'll, we'll move towards the end. Um, uh, Jeanette Campbell says, really appreciated the insights from this presentation and the discussion. Um, UWE Museum says, how does the tension that exists within race, economic, and so social cultural access translate in areas outside of the corporate area? The rural. The rural. Right. Well, I would say that, and this is one of the, the constructions that we create too, you know, the difference between ur urban and, and rural. rural. Mm -hmm. And there is a way that the state is centered on the urban. So Kingston is Jamaica, so <laughs> to speak, right? <laughs> but the rural peasantry would experience race. And when I, when I say peasantry, yes. <laughs> this is obviously, you know, a historical term yes. that is referring to the people who left the plantations and 
grow, grew, um, grew food for themselves yes. and were able in some instances to accumulate some measure of independence mm -hmm. through the growing of food. Now, to the extent that they could escape the plantation, that would determine the, the capacity for blacks to live as free. And we could argue that the extent to which people can therefore stay out of the, the interactions with the state and corporate society, etc., there is greater freedom to be as a black person and to affirm one's um, you know, sense of blackness mm -hmm. that emerged out of the independent peasantry in Jamaica. I mean, Garvey came out of that, right? Yes. Um, whereas the more debased conditions occur in urban centers, ghettos, etc. Yes. And I suppose this is why it preoccupies us so, because everything that's negative is happening at the base, whereas there is at least more space in the rural context. In the rural, right. Yeah. And, and I saw someone mention here the, the Mandeville elites versus the Kingston elite. But, but I, I would also have to quickly add that I'm aware of in Manchester, yeah. a black elite that emerged, um, a, a, a black middle class yeah. um, in, in Manchester in particular, um, that, that was very involved in in breaking some of these molds. What you were yeah. going to say? I want to say, though, that in the rural context, we also have to contend with the tourism product, right? right. And the way in which a tourism product is a waste product, you know, it's employing black bodies in a particular kind of way. Mm -hmm. um, they are impoverished. They are now contract workers with very little protections from their employers. Um, there is an expectation when we are selling Jamaica that, you know, white tourists can come and enjoy the pleasures of the sand and black bodies as well. Yes. So that is a part of the rural context and you might see it once you go. You see on the one side when you're driving to Montego Bay, the lavish hotels which prevents our access from the, the access to the beach yes. and on the other side of the road there is a slum. Yes. So Wow. Wow. Well let 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 me tell you, this is this has been a wonderful engagement. Um dealing with some great um, themes, all in a very compact and precise manner, and I really want to thank you for your um, presentation. But so many more comments coming in here. I, I really have to just read sure, them sure. very quickly. Um, so this was a really very great, this was really a great discussion. This is from Shivana Gottschalk, and I have to big up the students of um, culture, gender, and sexuality in Jamaican popular music, and the students of Caribbean civilization who okay. are also in the um, the session right, right now. Um, and 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 she says this was a really great discussion. Many of my questions answered. Thank you. Um, uh, ah, ahuak, ahuak. I'm 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 not sure if I'm pronouncing this right. Um, ahuak Indian Nation says greetings. What is a black people? What is that a nationality? People, you must first know who and what you are before you can comprehend your state of condition. Um, what are we discussing here? The narrative is incorrect. Is this a corporate venue? Have we, the people, now become a corporation? Well, this is a, 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 an, an event of the University of the West Indies, and we are very much into interrogating post-colonial and other narratives that relate to the emancipation of our people. And uh, I, I want to thank you for your comment. Candice Knight says, very interesting discussion. Fully enjoyed it. Maziki, thank you so All much right. for a, a powerful engagement. I know you have started a conversation through what you're, you have said now related to so many things. And it has added a great um, um, contribution to our discussion in the Humanities in Action virtual seminar series, Black Lives Matter, the historical quest to respect black bodies and lives. I want to also thank you, our, our audience, for joining us today. I want to thank you for the, um, the ways in which you have contributed and still contribute. Um, and we want to let you know that we continue the series next week with a presentation uh, by Dr. Jalani Naya.
oh no, I'm not following the order properly. Damian. Sorry. Um, I'm seeing, no, the next one is going to be Dr. Saran Stewart. Um, Black Lives Matter and Curriculum Development in Jamaica. And that will be on September 8th at 10 a.m. And we're looking forward to that um, engagement. We have Dr. Jalani Naya coming up. We have um, Dr. Damian Blake. Um, Dr. Isis Semaj Hall, Dr. Emily Zobel Marshall, and all presenting powerful presentations along the theme, Black Lives Matter. We want to remind you that the humanities matter. No matter what other disciplines we are engaged in, the days that we live in now have come to prove that the humanities indeed matter. Wherever you are, support the humanities departments in your institutions and support those here at the University of the West Indies as well. Because when all the other problems of the world have been solved, the human race will still have to live together. The humanities matters. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you again very soon. God bless. Thank you.